Now, since we finished um, innate immunity, we're going to move on to acquired immunity. And sometimes this is also called adaptive immunity because it basically learns. Your immune system has um, the ability to differentiate between self and non-self. And then when it does in encounter non-self, um, your B and T cells, your lymphocytes, um, are able to amplify the correct one and then um, make the appropriate effector cells are called. So the B cell that's, oh, there goes Kitty. Um, the B cell that's going to make the antibody is called an effector cell, and so is the T cell that's going to either help or kill a virus infected cell. So um, more little details, I just mentioned a few about um, acquired immunity or the lymphocytes. The different thing about the B cells and the T cells from our macrophages, dendritic cells, natural killer cells, neutrophils, whatever, is that they will only do their job against a very specific pathogen. And not just any old virus, but a B cell receptor is very specific for a special antigen. And I'll put an antigen up on the uh, slide in the next thing. It's basically the foreign thing that you're making a response against. We have at least a million different B cell receptors. Your B cell receptor actually will become the secreted antibody. And then um, you have about 10 million different T cell receptors. And I'll explain um, how they're made and where the diversity comes from in a little bit. Oh, Ginger's back. Okay. What is an antigen? An antigen is basically the thing that's foreign. Um, for the most part, what we're going to talk about here, the antigen is protein. Remember, proteins are globular, 3D structure, and um, this cartoon amplifies the idea that there's like this little piece hanging off this structure of a protein that is, in this case, rounded shape that that antibody is specific for. In this case, it's a pointy shape that that's specific for, and so on. But there are um, parts of proteins that are more different than others, and they are more likely to elicit an immune response, and those are called the antigenic determinants. So an antigen is that foreign protein, usually a uh, protein. A protein, foreign molecule, usually a protein, and then the antigenic determinant is that part that you actually make your response against. So how do B cells, before we even talk about how you make the receptor, let's just talk about how it, um, how the B cell is selected and then what happens after it's selected. So say um, chicken pox virus comes in your body and it's bigger than this and we're just going to focus on the part that your B cell sees. So this little red part is the um, part of that protein that happens to match this particular B cell, the red B cell. And that B cell has that antibody on its surface, it's its receptor, and it encounters that antigen. Um, a signal gets sent to that B cell. Actually, they're missing in here. A T cell has to tell it to do this, but we're going to get into that in a minute. So the B cell got the signal that yes, this antigen specific, yes, I need to do something to it, and it gets a growth factor signal to divide. And the B cell divides and divides and divides. It changes into two kinds of cells, a memory cell. So in any response, the B cells always save a few. Um, and these memory cells are going to continue to circulate. And um, I don't think this ratio is true. So we started out with one B cell, and they're showing you two memory cells. You're actually going to get probably hundreds or thousands of memory cells that are going to be hanging back for the next time you see this pathogen. You'll be able to respond to it even faster because you've multiplied the number of B cells that are available to recognize it. The other part of them go on and differentiate to become plasma cells. And plasma cells are basically antibody factories. They're still B cells, but their job now is to secrete the antibodies. So the antibody that used to be tethered in the membrane with a transmembrane receptor um, now has undergone um, a, um, mRNA splicing, actually, to make um, a different tail. And um, I talked in some of the classes about the different constant regions or tails on antibodies, and we'll look at it again in a minute. But the first antibody that gets released, actually, this is a not correct answer here. It should be the IgM, which is a pentamer of five antibody molecules hooked together. In any event, plasma cells start secreting the antibodies, and you start fighting off the infection. Um, how do antibodies help protect you from a pathogen? Well, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, they do a lot of the same things. Um, here it shows that the antibodies will bind all over the pathogen, whether it be a virus or bacteria, and basically um, neutralize it that it can't divide and it also um, can't get into a cell if it's a virus. And then those antibody-coated particles are targets for 
macrophages. Macrophages have to actually have a receptor for that constant region, that tail end of the antibody, and um, it gets attracted to it, and the uh, macrophages eat it up, get rid of it faster. Same thing's happening here. It's basically just clumping them together. Lastly, antibodies can attract the um, proteins called complement. So complement are a series of serum proteins that are always floating around in your blood. If the antibodies land exactly this distance between each other on a foreign cell, and this is probably a bacteria because that's a free living cell, um, the complement proteins are attracted and they start a cascade of activation, finally ending in a series of proteins that embed themselves. These are actually not defense and it's a different set of proteins and make a hole in the cell and the cell lyses. So that's a different ways that antibodies can help protect you. So how does that B cell get activated? I told you that that B cell, um, where'd he go? Here, um, should not go and turn into a plasma cell and copy itself unless it gets help from a T cell. So we're going to talk now um, a little bit about this whole cascade of reactions to help um, the immune system know there's a problem. The main cell that's involved here is the T helper cell. The T helper cell bridges the um, both sides of the immune system, both the humoral immune system. Um, the body's blood used to be called the body's humors, the fluid part of your body, and this is a really old, old name from that, that the antibodies were in the body's humors or the liquid fluid, so this is called humoral immunity. Your only way to really kill off an infection with the virus if it's already in the cells is to have a cytotoxic T cell go and um, secrete these um, killer molecules that are going to literally punch holes in the infected cell and make it die. So the T cytotoxic cell is a very cell to cell contact so that's called cellular immunity. Neither the B cell or the T cell, um, cytotoxic T cell, will do their job unless they get these cytokines, this growth factor released from the helper T cell to tell it it's okay. So all of these guys have pretty prominent receptors on their surface and that's to, to remind you and to show you that the B cell, the T cytotoxic, or the T helper cell will not get activated unless it's a very specific um, foreign protein and foreign antigen that's telling them to get activated. So essentially this B cell antibody molecule, this helper T cell, he has his T cell receptor right there, and this cytotoxic T cell right there are responding to that same pathogen and they're going to go kill it. So how does that T cell, T helper cell know that something's happening? I've mentioned the name antigen presenting cell a couple times. So basically some phagocyte that um, takes up that pathogen, and I'd still like to call this chicken pox virus, it engulfs it, it brings it into the lysosome, chops it up into pieces, and it presents it or puts it out on its surface to show the T cells. So the T cell recognizes just a little bit of the antigen. Um, it's actually an alpha helix, about 10 to 15 amino acids long. While I was in grad school, we were mapping the length and the critical amount that was needed to activate the T cell for different antigens. Um, that T cell is now activated. It secretes growth factors to itself so that it will make more of itself. It also makes memory cells for itself and that it will go give help to a B cell if that B cell has also encountered that chickenpox virus. So this is the chickenpox specific B cell. It has to get into proximity with that T cell. That's what our spleen and our lymphoid organs are for, is to give that place for them to come together and work together. And now that B cell will go on and make antibodies. Almost seems like a pin in needle in a haystack thing. Like how are you ever going to get the right helper T cell to find that antigen presenting cell? and then to be in the same location to be able to, this, this has to be at a close range, give that B cell the growth factor. The fact that they were all alive shows us that this happens. It's kind of amazing. I used to do experiments in the lab where I forced these cells to be near each other and I knew they worked, but it still it blows my mind that we find the correct B cell, the correct T cell, and we have this work. Killer T cells work in a similar way I think I need a picture anyway. It'll have to be that specific T cell that'll get activated by the helper T cell to now go on and kill this guy. I think the next slides just make this bigger, but I don't think that's the picture that I really want. Hmm. Let's deal with the antigen presenting cell thing for just a little bit longer. That's why I moved ahead. So, um, Here's the T cell receptor. 
So I said that we've already talked about how the B cells bind antibody. Yeah, all right, let's go do the antibody story. We've talked a little bit about how the B cell receptors, the antibodies bind their antigens. There's a variable region up here that's very specific for the antigen. Remember, this is a quaternary structure. We have two heavy chains, two light chains connected by disulfide bonds. This down, er, this area down here, both in the light chain and over here, are called the constant regions. They are uh, less changeable. The area up here is the part that binds the antigen. It's the variable region. Here's a 3D structure filling molecule of it. And here's showing us how it combines the antigens. So let's take the last couple of minutes of this podcast to talk about how the diversity could possibly be coded. Remember I said that there were over a million B cell receptors. Now we've talked about the Human Genome Project, and I hope you remember that there's only 18 or 19,000 genes in our body. So how could we possibly make a million B cell receptors? This was a question that was plaguing molecular biologists um, uh, in the mid-80s. It was around the time that I was... Um, in college and then going to grad school and they solved it while I was um, in that time. It was actually a molecular biology problem. They knew the region in the genome that coded for um, an antibody molecule, an Ig chain, but they needed to figure out how you could get such diversity and this is how. We look here at the the um, variable region. There are all these little cassettes. There's about a hundred different V regions about 30 different D regions and about six different J regions. Only one from each section comes together for that final molecule. So the really fascinating thing also is that this rearrangement takes place during the B cell development. It happens at the DNA level. So when the B cell is developing in embryonic DNA, these one V region is chosen, one D, one J, and so on and they get spliced together and now this will be that B cells DNA. Remember it um, arises in the bone marrow as growth factors tell it to do. One of the things the growth factors do is tell you to do recombination here. It's called recombinase gene. Um, RAG gene it's called. Anyway that gets recombined. Remember there were different um, green regions down here. These are the different tails you can put on. There's IgM there's several IgG, uh, IgD, sorry, this is a transmembrane one, several IgGs, um, IgE, and uh, IgA. Anyway, um, at different times, oops, um, those will get spliced together. You actually get those last ones as an alternative splicing um, thing in the mRNA when we need to change tails. So they get spliced together. Believe it or not, the same thing of this V and J thing happens in, uh, I don't have a picture here, in the light chain too. We're not just, we're not, just not talking about it here. So you can do the math of the numbers of um, recombination possibilities that you can get to have these two variable regions. That's how we can get up to a million. One extra little tidbit is that it tends to um, have a mutation rate too as you make more antibodies. These mutate, good or bad, might make a better binding one or not. I think I better stop here so that I can upload this to YouTube. We'll pick up with the T-cell in the next one.